So, we find our heroes in a tavern. The dim glow of a few sparse candles fills the room with an atmosphere that is both cozy yet ominous. As you sit there, waiting expectantly for excitement, a disheveled hooded figure bursts onto the scene and calls you to adventure. And I'm gonna need you to roll initiative. Yeah, a year ago, this is about all that I knew about Dungeons and Dragons. I had never played before, but I could at least recognize that cliched intro to a classic D&D campaign. This kind of medieval fantasy role-playing adventure with spell casting and sword fighting and the potential of encountering either dark and mysterious oubliettes or a mythical reptilian flying monster. Sometimes both. I have no idea if I pronounced Ubliets correctly. It's just, I was, it was describing a dungeon and a dragon as a joke, because I'm very funny. So last year, I set off on a quest of sorts. I wanted to learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons, finally, and find friends that I could play with, and maybe, just maybe, become a dungeon master for an adventure of my own from not knowing any of the rules or mechanics of D&D to becoming a dungeon master in less than a year. That's what I wanted to do. And I know that probably doesn't sound impressive. I have become the master of the plastic math shapes. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, along with, uh... Eh, nothing else you can detect right now. And from the outside, Dungeons & Dragons looks like a complicated game that can be overwhelming to new players. Sure, I think we all get the gist of the game. Players become heroic characters and set forth on a collective storytelling campaign run by a Dungeon Master or DM. The DM sets the stakes and helps guide players through the core narrative and will try their hardest to kill you. Oh, and there's dice but I, I don't know what they do. This one is, this one's pointy. But all right, it sounds simple enough, I guess, but for a new player, it can be whelming. There are entire books of rules on how to play. Every class of character you want to play functions differently. It's all a kept track of on this complicated looking sheet of paper. Numbers, since when do I need math to tell a story? And what is this? What is it? And on top of all that, so much of the game takes place in everyone's collective imagination. Sure, you can have maps and little figures to coordinate better in combat, but most of the time, the only thing in front of you while you play is a vast wooden sea of imagination and endless possibilities known as a tabletop. And more dice. Why are there so many of these. Which ones do I roll for what? And why do they look so weird? I mean... So that's a bad exit. This one looks fine. I have always wanted to play Dungeons & Dragons since I was in high school. I had seen the game pop up in a few shows and movies, of course, and I had a few friends who played and regaled me with their stories about it. It sounded like the coolest, most creative game. I just... I didn't know where to start. Learning how it all worked always seemed so staggering. So I did what I always do when I want to learn more about something. I searched on YouTube. Subscribe. <laughs> Nowadays, there are great channels like Dungeon Dudes and Tulak the Barbarian and a bunch of more great YouTubers who dive into D&D content. My friend Dale from the channel Monarchs Factory has a lot of fascinating D&D videos that are incredibly thought provoking and you should definitely subscribe. But the first time I searched on YouTube for info about Dungeons and Dragons was like a decade ago. And the only D&D video that I remember finding on YouTube <laughs> was, uh, well. Ah! Ah! Quest with me to this den of evil where we will bind to Raptus and drive a stake into his heart. Yeah, so this is a VHS that came with the board game Dragon Strike, a kind of watered down version of Dungeons and Dragons released in 1993. The video serves as a kind of 
introductional guide and teaser story for the kind of adventures that you can expect when playing through this magical and treacherous adventure with your non-corporeal friends. Is this like a video game? Sort of. But it uses the most powerful information processor in the world. Your brain. Wait, did the IT crowd do a deep cut reference to this? What is it, some sort of computer game? In a sense, except it uses the most powerful processor known to man, the human mind. And it's all hosted by this charismatic turtleneck. Feeling brave tonight? Oh, hi. Brave enough to do battle with hideous monsters? Hmm? Are you gonna be there? Close your eyes, open your mind, and I'll transport you to another realm. <sighs> I'm gonna need a drink. That feels appropriate. In spite of this strange VHS, my fascination with the game actually continued to grow over the years. I became that annoying person who not so casually tossed around the idea to any and all people who would listen that I sort of kind of desperately wanted to play this nearly 50 year old adventure game. Maybe even in part, because I knew it had this controversial history in the public eye as a dangerous game for children. D&D, &D, it's become popular with children anywhere from grammar school on up. There are those who are fearful that the game in the hands of vulnerable kids could do harm. For instance, one case, the parents were actually saw their child summon uh, Dungeons and Dragons demons into his room. Police are blaming D&D. &D. Obviously, that controversy was bogus. D&D &D isn't evil. With all the rules it has, it's lawful neutral at best. But as a teenager, I so desperately wanted to be dark and edgy. Clearly, these days, I still do. Quick, how do I become moody and mysterious? I bought candles, is that anything? Anyway, so a few years ago, a close friend revealed that he was going to run a short D&D survival horror story, and that sounded so fun to me. My mind raced with character ideas and backstory and all of the fun quirks that I would play into. I even worked on a silly character voice so I could bring some levity to the dark and sinister world that my friend had crafted. But that didn't work out so well. You see, other than the DM, I didn't know anyone else I would be playing with. It can feel incredibly vulnerable and nerve-wracking to roleplay in front of people that you don't know well, especially veteran D&D &D players who know their characters and the game mechanics inside and out. I was for sure the freshest to the game, and any knowledge that I had uh, on how to play came from a sexually aggressive floating head. Close your eyes and imagine you are your character. Imagine the treasure, the power. Every single turn I asked a million questions, slowing everyone and everything down. All of the other players were genuinely super patient and so nice and excited for me to play D&D, &D, but I, I was in my own head about it. I felt like I was taking away from their fun. So I let my character die after two sessions and I stopped showing up, which in hindsight is probably not a great way to handle it. But my anxiety got the better of me. I thought everyone would have more fun if I wasn't around and they could all play without carrying the dead weight of my character. I don't know why nothing was clicking in my head. In retrospect, the math behind the current fifth edition of D&D is honestly quite simple and streamlined, but at the time, I just wasn't getting it. No one was explaining it to me in a way that made sense. And my interest in giving the game another shot was fading fast. But then, last year, I met my girlfriend, Emily. Really early on, we had a lot of conversations about Dungeons and Dragons. She and her friends had been playing together for some time, and I, obviously, had a lot of questions. Uh, she told me all about her character, Nissa Posey, the gnome ranger, and all the shenanigans that she'd get up to with her adventuring party each week. And I think Em could tell that listening to her recount these delightful personal stories with Dungeons and Dragons reignited my interest. I told her how I struggled with starting and learning the rules. But she assured me that the best way to learn was by watching others play. 
She admitted herself that she'd only ever seriously gotten interested in playing D&D by listening to the Adventure Zone podcast and watching a new actual play series that she wanted me to check out. Em swiftly grabbed the remote for the TV, loaded up YouTube, and pulled up a show that I had never heard of before, but one that genuinely changed everything for me. Welcome, one and all, to Dimension 20. Our cast of players will assume the role of heroic adventurers embarking on a dangerous quest. Without any further ado, Dimension 20 proudly presents Fantasy High! Oh my god, this show is amazing. Dimension 20 is an actual play D&D show by College Humor on their streaming service, Dropout. Uh, this video is not sponsored by Dimension 20. I know that that sentence uh, made it seem like it was. Uh, it's not. I just really love this show and I want to yell at you about it because it is the show that finally got me to play D&D. The series features a group of incredibly funny, quick, and talented performers who sit in a big, ominous dome and play Dungeons and Dragons. Now, the main cast of Emily Axford, Lee Wilson, Ali Beardsley, Zach Oyama, Siobhan Thompson, and Brian Murphy bring their characters to life with humor, drama, and vulnerability. They all bring so much to the table, which by the way is beautifully styled with these unbelievably cool and creative miniature characters and sets masterfully crafted by Rick Perry and his team of wizard artists. I mean, this stuff is, look at it. It's so fucking rad. And the humble dungeon master, Brennan Lee Mulligan is this evil mastermind pulling the strings of these unique stories with lovable characters in creative settings. With three full seasons, two shorter side quest adventures with fun guest players, and a live season, Dimension 20 has put out a tremendous amount of entertainment in just over two years. But if you're like me and you get overwhelmed about catching up on hours and hours and hours of content, don't panic. Firstly, because there's still a pandemic happening and you might have time to binge watch some stuff. And secondly, it's an anthology series. Every new season is a brand new world with brand new characters and a self-contained story. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them really quick. So the first season, Fantasy High, is wonderful. Just imagine a bunch of John Hughes style coming of age story tropes put in a world that mixes modern day with fantasy adventures. High schoolers are tieflings, high elves, and half orcs. School staff are wizards and werewolves. Estranged fathers are sweet and caring devils. And the halfling postal workers say a cab. Bud Cubby speaks up and says laws are threats made by the dominant socioeconomic ethnic group in a given nation. It's just a promise of violence that's enacted and police are basically an occupying army. You know what I mean? You guys want to make some bacon? Police are blaming D&D. Their second full season, The Unsleeping City, is a little bit more complex. It takes place in modern day New York, but with a kind of secret underground magical world kind of hidden under it. The season is a love letter to New York that encapsulates a lot of the themes of the city itself. There is a contradiction within New York City, which is, it's this gritty, hyper-realist, cynical, like, buddy, you, you better wake up kind of place. And then it's also the, you know, concrete jungle where dreams are made of, the city of dreams. If I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. And you're like, how do you hold both of those truths in one hand? I can't really describe more of this season without giving too many spoilers away, but it is phenomenal. Their latest season that's still airing new episodes right now is called Crown of Candy. The setting is dark and grim with medieval political intrigue and backstabbing violence in a world where people are made of food. Cheese warriors and vegetable politicians and a royal family made of sugary sweets. It's like if somebody took a textbook food pyramid and wrote a tome of unnecessary Game of Thrones-esque lore. It's great and sad. 
Actually, just a little correction from future Scott. I said that A Crown of Candy is still airing new episodes, and that was true in April when I started writing this video, but it's August now. I'm bad at keeping a schedule. This season actually just ended this week, and it was uh, just amazing and beautiful. Please go watch it. And they're also announcing a new season next week, so I'm super excited for that as well. Anyway, back to the video. Have I convinced you to at least give this show a shot yet? Because I gotta tell you, I watched 10 seasons of Grey's Anatomy while growing out this gross quarantine beard. So this is me recommending you something better than that. Dimension 20 is, in my opinion, the best show. Watching it demystified Dungeons and Dragons for me. The combat, which seemed so daunting and hard to parse, became infinitely more clear thanks to the beautiful visual language of the filming and editing of these masterfully crafted miniature battle sets. The editors popping up graphics to track health, temporary hit points, and death saving throws to make it easier to follow and understand. The box of doom intensifying dramatic moments, hammering home that a simple roll of the dice can have a profound impact on the story, especially when the players react triumphantly upon rolling a plastic shape onto a table and having it naturally land on the number 20. From that, I learned that getting a nat 20 is one of the most exciting things that can possibly happen in D&D. &D. Do a nat 20. I am uh, notoriously bad at rolling nat 20s. It took me dozens of tries before I captured this one as B-roll for this video. Meanwhile, my cat Sparta casually got one on his very first try. That show off. The nat 20. Oh my god. <laughs> Now, I know that these sound like simple things on paper. Mini figs, tracking HP, dice rolling, nothing extraordinary when it comes to these kinds of games, but they are executed so perfectly in Dimension 20. And it's all run by a DM who is incredibly fair and passionate about crafting a memorable experience for everyone at the table. When I'm at that table or when I'm like doing prep work, I am only thinking about Lou, Siobhan, Emily, Murph, Allie, and Zach. I don't mean to think that we're like never thinking about the audience, but like as a dungeon master, it's so important for me to be like, I am thinking about how to make my players happy. That that might then go out and resonate with somebody else is, I mean, the term icing on the cake doesn't even begin to describe It's like so meaningful. And that's precisely what happened. My girlfriend Emily soon DM'd a short one-shot for me and a few friends. A one-shot is a short, simple story that you can theoretically start and finish in one session, or a small handful of sessions if the players goof around too much. Ours took a month and a half to finish, but it was so much fun! It was the catalyst I needed to start playing other small campaigns with friends on the weekends. And then one of those friends, my coworker Jordan, started a brand new Dungeons and Dragons podcast with some other lovely people. And I'm on that as well. It's called Late to the Party, if you want to listen to it. It's set in an alternate version of modern day Miami, Florida. I play a human fighter named Coach Tucker who lives with his mom. Actually, his mom lives with him. It's an important distinction. Uh, he loves gardening, has really complicated daddy issues. It's available anywhere. Podcasts are found. Link in the description. So here I am playing Dungeons and Dragons and I'm loving it. I'm creating fun PCs with deep backstories, fighting alongside cohorts with their own colorful characters, exploring fantastical quasi-medieval worlds like Florida. This beautiful, wonderful game has introduced me to new friends, new worlds, and new adventures. And all I think about is the next time I get to roll and tell stories with my friends. Edgy teenage Scott would be disappointed though, because they sound like a bunch of nerds. But okay, so my quest is complete, right? Uh, I started out not knowing how to play, not knowing the mechanics, and thanks to Dimension 20 and my friends, I'm playing D&D &D regularly. I'm on a podcast playing this game, link in the description again. 
what more could I possibly ask for, right? I mean, <laughs> what more is there to, oh no. Oh, I want a DM. Oh, I want a DM very badly, please. Okay, so the benefit of starting D&D as a player is that you only need to know about the ins and outs of your specific character build. All the other players can handle their own stuff, and all you need to worry about are the rules that specifically apply to you and your style of play. If you're a spellcaster, learn how to use and regenerate spell slots. If you're a sneaky rogue, learn how to assassinate people in surprise combat rounds. If you're a human fighter, like me, learn how to use your second wind ability? Something that you have never bothered to research. Wait, I can heal myself? Since when? Level one? Whoops! My point is, there's already a lot of work that goes into being a player character in Dungeons and Dragons, but it is a manageable amount of work once you know how you want to play. Making the jump from player to dungeon master, however, means that level of work and research jumps exponentially from this to this. That was a nat one. <laughs> yeah, so here's the thing. I have offered to DM for the first time in two days, and I'm gonna be doing it on a charity live stream with an audience. So that's already incredibly daunting. I am stressing out here. I'm gonna need some help. Thankfully, I know a perfect person I can call up to help me prepare for my first time ever as Dungeon Master. <laughs> now you're working together. Sorry, nope, wrong person. Uh, but you and me, we're gonna, we're gonna talk later. Uh, no, I meant this person. Hello to all of Scott's listeners and viewers. My name is Brandon Lee Mulligan. I'm the Dungeon Master for Dimension Twenty. So I guess the the kind of crux of my video uh, is that Dimension Twenty is a show that I watched before I started ever playing D&D &D. and seeing all the amount of fun that everyone was having and the creativity and the world building and the collaborative storytelling is was so like enchanting to me that I, I just really really wanted to get involved with it and now I'm in a space where I'm in like four campaigns and I can't find time to yes. do everything yes yes we gotcha baby we gotcha do you think that was secretly or perhaps not so secretly kind of a mission of of the show oh man uh the 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 premise of your question involves a version of me with so much more self-confidence than i actually have the, like the version of me where i'm starting fantasy high and i'm like what are my aims to accomplish with this show what do i want my legacy as opposed to me just flop sweating and being like don't fuck this up i also reached out to my current dm jordan from the podcast uh, to ask her for some tips hi my name is jordan bulky i am the dungeon master on the Late to the Party podcast, on which Scott is one of our player characters. This is my third time being a DM, first time for a podcast, and I've been playing Dungeons & Dragons since 2014. My The first time I DM'd, I tried to homebrew, and it just, it was a disaster. A homebrew, if you don't know, is basically any kind of content that isn't found in the official source books. Uh, monsters, weapons, spells, unique settings, uh, special mechanics, etc. It can be daunting. I don't have time for that. I'm already burning the candles at both ends, trying to figure something out. Yeah, I don't know how idioms work, but I do know that step one is to find a quick one shot online that I don't have to mod at all. And then mod it anyway, because I can't help it. Absolutely, if it's your first time DMing, start with a pre-built campaign. Once I started hosting and, and 
DMing a campaign that was pre-built, I was able to understand and internalize all of the things that go into DMing. I was much more prepared to build my own. This one looks good. Uh, there's a wizard named Finithir who is turned into a sheep by an evil wizard named Steven, and everyone has to fight to defeat Steven, the evil wizard, and turn Finithir back to normal. It's very Emperor's New Groove, and I like that. Oh, and it looks like this is good for players level four through five, so I don't see any harm in making everyone level five. Yep, and now to familiarize myself with a lot of the rules that I don't typically run into on the player side of things. My friend Ethan, who's going to be on this charity live stream and is also on the Late to the Party podcast, once told me that I have a romantic but also austere kind of mindset about the rules. And I don't know what that means, but I do think it's fair. I know there's gotta be some kind of balance between being overly strict with the rules and being flexible enough to let my players be creative. Right, well, I think what you're saying there, Scott, is like, is exactly right. The, the balance is interesting because they're the exact same instinct. Like that is, it, it looks like it's two competing things, but that's an illusion, it's actually one thing. Because whether you're enforcing a boundary or allowing a rule to break to let someone do something cool, you're managing the same thing, which is your player's enjoyment of the game. I mean, I definitely, like and appreciate the rule of cool. Can I, Can I cast backpack? friends on the liquor in my flask? Um, uh, so that anyone who drinks from it will have friends cast on them? Um, that's for sure not how the spell is used, but I'm gonna allow it because it's cool. d and is a fun game. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people choose to do something cool Listen and it's up. great. But giving your players everything they ask for isn't the surefire way to make sure they have a good time. Because a lot of times people will ask for something they don't want. Being like a kid, pushing the boundary with their parent of like what they can get away with, right? And when kids do that, this is like classic child psychology, they're not always looking for a yes. They're looking sometimes for the boundary. Tell me if this will work. Can You're I jam the cameras with like an electromagnetic force? Can you make up a bunch of bullshit magic in the middle of the heist? <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that a medicine check, since I'm like chest compressing, is kind of like um, an attack? Do you think reality is strained by the fact that a hawk is helping you with surgery right now? <laughs> how much How much lower do you want me to go? <laughs> As a DM, you should be, uh, I think, a pretty s solid sentinel on the wall of consequence. You want to be there to like make stuff matter. So it's the same impulse, right? Letting something break in a moment for something cool to happen is making sure the players are having the best possible time and enforcing rules in moments where it would drain the stakes to not enforce them is doing the exact same thing. It's preserving the necessary balance of magic and also reality and consequence that makes this fantastical adventure have meaning. The real object of the game is for everybody to have fun. And if the game isn't fair, nobody will. And this is the same philosophy and energy that I want to bring into this one shot, which is happening right now. Oh my God, okay. We are live. We are live. Today is gonna be my very first time ever DMing anything. I'm very excited. I'm incredibly nervous. I don't know if hey, we sure want a lot of like fanfare or something before we dive on into everything. Paint us a picture, um, Scott. Yeah, I'll paint you a little word picture. So it is a quiet, calm, beautiful summer day. And there is an annual festival going on. It is a summer festival. People are out in the streets. Everyone's having a great time. Uh, this town is just big enough that there would be a lot of local vendors. Like, there's, this is kind of a big... I studied the rules and prepared for a handful of outcomes, but once we all got into character and started playing, the only thing that mattered to me was if everyone was having fun. And it started out Great. Lots of laughs and gags as everyone role-played their characters brilliantly. But then I became worried once combat started. Apparently, letting the PCs start at level 5 made them a little too strong for the enemies that they encountered. 
Everyone unleashed these powerful abilities and absolutely demolished the bad guys with ease. This combat is not as challenging as I wanted it to be. I think whoever wrote this did not <laughs> intend for you guys to do as well. Apparently um, we should have been level four. Oh no. Oh no. This should have been level four. Why did I make them level five? What was I thinking? Level five? I shouldn't be allowed to make decisions like this. It felt like, it felt like I was doing a disappointing job of making the stakes meaningful and impactful. To be completely honest, it felt like everyone was bored. And that's not a good thing to feel as a DM. I was disappointed in myself for not making the combat more thrilling. You all are being too efficient, and I need there to be some damage dealt in some capacity. Fair. Yeah, I haven't lost a hit point yet. So, I spontaneously made Steven the evil wizard magically turn a bookshelf into a splintered wooden dragon that immediately knocked one of the PCs down. Croydon and Zazmak will take 24 points of damage. Okay. Croydon, you down? Oh yeah. Yep. Is I'm it sorry. half for everybody else? It is half for everyone else. It is 12 damage for everyone else. I'm not doing hot either. So I take 12. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the tone became more serious and dire almost immediately. I did feel bad though. Being the evil forces who want to attack and kill your friends' characters is fun at first, but quickly becomes emotionally challenging. Especially once I saw their demeanor change from happy and silly to, oh, fuck, this is serious. I don't know, it's hard to see your friends struggle, especially if you are the cause. I don't know, maybe I'm overreacting. Is this tough for other DMs? It is fun for me to be the villain. Okay, so clearly I'm alone in this. There's some psychodrama to it all. You tap into those darker places. You get to look your friend in the eye and be like, I'm going to destroy you. And then you're like, ah, I don't get to say that in regular life. I don't like get to go to the grocery store and be like, hey neighbor, I'm gonna destroy you. Yeah, I probably should stop shouting that out of my window every many times a day. But I think that what is a very weird part about that for being a dungeon master is you are antagonizing your player characters. You are thwarting them. The villain is menacing them. You're attacking them. You're trying to kill them. That still comes from a deep place of service, right? Because that's what people have asked for. They want to be heroes and you can't be a hero without overcoming adversity. When I'm playing these bad guys, I do have to tap into a place where they are reveling in defeating the good guys. And I don't do my PCs any service by pulling any punches because it cheapens the victory of the PCs if I was holding back. The main thing that's enjoyable about playing villains is putting up that wall to your PCs and knowing that they're going to surmount it in some incredibly creative way that you have no ability to predict or foresee. Endlessly exciting. You know, that makes me think about everything that we've done on the podcast so far, the world and story that Jordan has crafted. I mean, how much of it has been all screwed up by throwing four players and their shenanigans into the mix? How much have we as players ruined your story so far? Um. I mean, the players don't ruin the story. The players help write the story. You don't have to be the one driving the story forward 100% of the time. Uh, even as a DM, I largely am not in, like, I'm in control, but I'm not driving us forward. That's that's all on the players. Aww. I don't know. That makes a lot of sense. As I said earlier, this is what tabletop role-playing games like D&D &D are. Collaborative storytelling. The DMs out there have a lot of knowledge and power, but the creativity of the players and the chance of the die can create these unpredictable moments of heartbreak and triumph and self-reflection and unbelievable luck that completely beats 
all odds. There are so many of these moments in Dimension 20, and I'm not going to feel too bad right now when I spoil just one of them. Just to give you an example of the level of pure emotional adrenaline that can come from this game. If you really want to go in fresh, skip to this time code below to avoid any spoilers, but I have to talk about this moment from Unsleeping City that stuck out to me the most. This is Sophia by Cicleta. At the start of the story, it's clear that Sophia has lost so much. Her husband has left her, she's questioning if she can trust her family, and she drinks a lot. Do you want to grab a drink or something? Yeah, For one go. more drink, I'll leave. She's an ordinary human who starts uncovering this secret world of magic in New York City, and from there starts training as a monk in a mystical monastery to learn how to protect the city from the big bad evil guy. She learns that spirits congregate above the Empire State Building, who are supposed to impart power onto the Chosen One, but no one has been able to figure out who the Chosen One is. And when they go to the top of the tower, it doesn't even appear as if the spirits are there at all. Sophia is met with silence. But then she remembers what she heard from the person who previously attempted to find the Chosen One. When you get to the top, I know what it'll seem like, but there is someone there. You look around, who is here at the top of the Empire State Building? But I'm here. There is no chosen one, predestined by some mysterious spirits. There was no prophecy that determined Sophia Bicicleta to be this extra special warrior hero. Everyone has the potential to do great things things, including a drunk hairdresser from Staten Island. So I guess I just choose myself to be the chosen one? <laughs> yes! Ah. One of the most ambitious things that Brennan as a DM does is orchestrate these profound themes and ideas for each season of Dimension 20. Uh, when I was initially writing this video, I spent like 10 minutes analyzing the themes of each season, but there's one overarching theme that runs through every season and side quest. Radical acceptance of who you are in the face of adversity. Whether that's your friends accepting you, your family accepting you, or in this case, accepting yourself. The moment with Sophia on top of the Empire State Building is very a very New York moment as well, at least for me, which is that when you're in New York, you're under the buildings. They're oppressively on top of you. It's the highest population density, you know, in, a, in America, I'm pretty sure, Manhattan at least, where you're just surrounded by millions of people. It's easy to feel like, like maybe I'm not the protagonist, maybe I'm not the chosen one. Look around me. How could I be the main character? Look at this city. But that feeling of defeatedness that can sometimes come on like a cold, gray, rainy New York day where you're just getting the stuffing kicked out of you by life, and then you just go like, actually, I can choose right now to be the chosen one, right? I can just choose myself. This moment is so powerful. It's the kind of moment that I want to chase down as a player and something that I, as a DM, want to create. But Dimension 20 accomplished this with uh, dozens of hours of episodes and my one shot has maybe four to five hours in it. Tops. I can't deliver on satisfying character arcs, but I could hope for at least one memorable moment. So back in our story, the group burnt down the gnarled bookshelf dragon and knocked Steven the evil wizard unconscious. There was only one thing left for the players to do. They had to use a broken magic wand to transform Finithier the sheep back to normal. And I want to be clear here, this, this was not guaranteed. In fact, it was going to be massively difficult. I even wrote an entire ending where they could fail so hard that the sheep turns into a pile of gelatinous goop on the ground. So failure was expected. 
as I said, you will have to make a check, and if you do it wrong, if you fail, something horrible will happen. Croydon says, I mean, I'll take my best shot at this spell. It's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. But, but then, in a way that I couldn't predict or account for, all of their characters came together and joined their hands to channel all of their magical energy into this broken wand. Can all four of us hold the wand together? Yeah, you know what? All four of you can hold <laughs> the wand together. We're gonna catch a at this. <laughs> and then this happened. You got Croydon this. just holds onto the wand and says, Well, here goes nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's an eight plus three on the first one. Okay. Oh, God. Please, please roll well. Okay, okay. Net 20! Yes! Let's go! What? Let's go. Let's take a journey to that nat 20. Let's take a journey to that right, oh so right there. Oh my gosh. Nat 20. Very few things in this one shot went the way that I planned. Jordan, Tyler, Cam, and Ethan put their characters into this tiny world and together we all told a fun, hilarious, and at times, dramatic story that I'm gonna remember for a long time. And I feel this way every weekend when we record Late to the Party. I admit that while writing this video, this incredibly long video, it felt silly talking about Dungeons and Dragons this much when I've been playing the game for less than a year. And especially to dedicate an enormous chunk of this video talking about being a dungeon master when I've done it exactly once. But that's how fun this game is and how much it has already impacted my life. Dungeons and Dragons is a game that lives almost entirely in the minds of you and your friends. Sure, you can have figures and maps and art that you drew of your characters that all live in the physical world, but at its core, it's a game where you very simply sit around a table or a computer screen with your friends and you just tell a story together. For the podcast, we've had to record six hour Zoom calls, but when I am thinking back to those memories, when I'm recalling our adventures, my mind does not bring up me sitting in a chair, staring at a computer for six hours. Instead, I so clearly see the adventures of our characters cracking jokes and doing wild shenanigans to save the day. Dungeons and Dragons is, is the best of storytelling and cooperation with your friends and playing video games that just happen to only be occurring in your mind. D&D is having this renaissance right now, and I've been playing it since I was 10 years old. When I was a kid, I was homeschooled. I went to a LARP camp that I worked at for many years. Like I had a very alternative upbringing, but there's this weird thing I feel like looking back when I was like, oh, well, all I want to do is play this game. This is storytelling. It's doing bits. It's laughing with your friends. It's getting invested and involved. And the game portion is continually exciting and fresh and new. Why would you do anything else but play this game? And I do have to say this. While D&D is the game that brought me into tabletop role-playing games, it's not for everyone. It's not going to corrupt the minds of young players as parents in the 80s believed, but it is a game published by Wizards of the Coast, a corporation that's going through its own real controversies right now for creating a hostile work environment for people of color. And I want to be clear that this video is not me giving Wizards of the Coast a pass for any of that, just because they happen to make a game that I enjoy playing. If through this video, I've encouraged you to give tabletop role-playing games a shot, Dungeons & Dragons is not the only one out there. There are so many great games from independent publishers that you can and should try out. I'm sure you'll find many excellent recommendations in the comments. I encourage people to leave recommendations in the comments. This is simply my story, my journey into the world of role-playing games. And I really do hope that it inspires you 
to tell your own stories around the table with your friends. So, we find our heroes in a tavern. The dim glow of a few sparse candles fills the room with an atmosphere that is both cozy yet ominous. As you sit there, waiting expectantly for excitement, a disheveled hooded figure bursts onto the scene and calls you to adventure. And I'm gonna need you to roll initiative. Hello, can you tell I'm filming this after everything else? My shirt changed again. I just wanted to say thank you for watching and thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially because the financial support helps as I'm trying to tackle new kinds of topics on this channel. It's very kind of personal, very different kind of video for me to make. And if you want a reason to support me on Patreon, we are running a special offer right now where you can get these wonderful nerd pins. Very D&D inspired. I like them a lot. Unfortunately, I didn't have them on hand to record some cool video stuff, but just imagine they are exactly the same quality as this NerdSync pin that you can get in our merch store, only with this brand new design. I'm so excited for these. All you have to do is support me on Patreon at the $10 tier or higher. The special offer is running from right now, today, to August 25th. So very limited span of time to get them. Also, August 25th is my birthday. So I'd really love if you supported me on Patreon as a gift to me for my birthday. And also as a fun twist, I'm actually giving you a gift of this very exclusive, wonderful nerd pen. Links as always will be in the description. As I said, this whole video has simply been my experience finding and playing Dungeons and Dragons, but I wanna hear yours in the comments. Have you played before? Are you still searching for a party? Do you have a fun story from one of your sessions that still stands out to you? Write it down in the comments below to share it with everyone and spread the fun of this game around. While you're doing that, I obviously have to recommend that you watch Dimension 20 if you haven't already. I promise, just watch the first two episodes of their first season, Fantasy High, and you will be hooked. The entire season is available for free on YouTube and every following season is up on their subscription service, Dropout. Again, this video is not sponsored by College Humor or anything like that. I just think Dimension 20 is a beautiful and creative show and I want it to continue for as long as the people making it want to do it. Links will be in the description down below. And I have to give a massive, massive thank you to Brennan Lee Mulligan and Jordan Balky for sitting down to talk with me about Dungeons and Dragons. If you want to hear the full spicy, unedited interviews, they're not really that spicy, but they are really interesting. Uh, they will be available on Patreon uh, for free. You don't even have to be a patron if you want to listen to those. But if you do want to support the channel, like these wonderful scrolling names do, that would be great as well. People like Lori Timms, Everett Parrott, Havelock Smiggles, It's Quintley, Jonathan Lenowski, Marion Bill Cotton, Blueberry, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsing. Link in the description. So many links in the description. If you want more story time videos from me, here's one about how the Spider-Man villain Mysterio changed my life, seriously. But oh, what is this? The second video here seems to be the first episode of Dimension 20's Fantasy High. Go watch it. My name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics, or in this case, D&D. See ya. This is the dopest thing <laughs> we've ever done. <laughs>